And welcome to Even the Trunchbull, our show about children's books and why we still love them as adults. She's Nina. They're Matt. And we think that children's books are for everyone because we've all been kids. Even, Even the, the Trunchbull. Trunchbull. They're all mistakes, children. Filthy, nasty things. Glad I never was one. From Roald Dahl's beloved Matilda, despite her protestations. Each episode, we'll be reviewing one picture book and one chapter book. We're starting off with the books that we read as kids, but if you've got a book that you'd like us to review, especially if you are currently a kid, please get in touch. You can email us on eventhetrunchbull at gmail.com or catch us on Twitter at trunchbullpod. And this week we're reading about moles. Later this episode we're reading another classic, Kenneth Graham's Wind in the Willows, but first I'm (laughs) delighted to introduce our first poo book. (laughs) You can't have a children's books podcast and not talk about poo. Absolutely. So glad we've got round to it. <laughs> the Little Mole Who Knew It Was None of His Business is by Werner Holtzwarth and Wolf Elbruck. It's originally a German book. From Kleinen Maulwurf, der wissen wollte, wer ihm auf den Kopf gemacht hat. Uh, I always read this in French as a child. And it was like a massive favourite in my family. But you've just discovered it, haven't you, Matt? I have, yeah. I don't know a lot of German at all, but I'm pretty sure the Kopf is head. So I'm interested in what the direct translation is. Because obviously the English title, we've got a very subtle um, double meaning of the word business. Yeah. So I don't like the English translation of the title. Um, but it relies on like a sort of syntax that works in French and in German, I think the French translation was better, that doesn't really work in English. So the direct translation is, the little mole who wanted to know who had done on its head. We don't say (laughs) done by itself (laughs) in English. But it's better, right? Yeah, Yeah, it's good. (laughs) I mean, it's exactly what it says on the tin. I I mean, I suppose the, the English title is quite very English, isn't it? Because it's... It's very euphemistic. E- e- yeah, even with something as kind of mild as poo, there's yeah. the need to throw in a euphemism. Yeah. This isn't my <laughs> business that I'm wearing as a hat for this entire book. <laughs> well, so why don't you tell us what happens in the book, Matt? So, there's a little mole, a little uh, increasingly angry uh, mole, with good reason, who basically, so he climbs out of his little hole in the morning um, to see whether the sun's up yet and immediately um, gets a poo done on his head and it looks like a big sausage and then it it lands on its head uh, and it's sort of curled up there, little curly poo. And he basically spends the whole book going round all of the animals saying, did you do this poo on my head? And they're like, no, it couldn't have been me because my poo looks like this. And then all of these animals proceed to poo like right next to him um, yeah. and sort of <laughs> splash him with bits of poo and that proof that it, it, <laughs> that it can't be there. It wasn't their poo. Uh, so this carries on for a while and he comes across some flies and he goes, ah, well, these will be the guys to ask. Um, And they say, all right, cool, yeah, just hold on there one minute. And they have a little nibble of the poo on his head. And they say, oh, that'll be a dog poo, that. So he figures, right, well, it'll be the butcher's dog um, who's asleep in his kennel with his head sticking out. Um, So the mole climbs up on top of the kennel and does a poo on the dog's head. The end. So did you like it? It's a weird book. I think I'll, I, I was I was intrigued and baffled by it. I don't know. I suppose maybe I'm slightly squeamish. I've never been like hugely into poo humour. If you were, if you were a kid who was into poo humour, um, which I was, then it's a, it's a classic of our time, isn't it? For a certain kind of scatological child, there's a sort of joy in the description of each poo. Yeah. I, I guess it kind of like it goes somewhere to like normalise poo as well because I know that can be like yeah, a bit of an of issue course. for some kids yeah. like sort of feeling shy or scared or whatever else because it's yeah yeah I suppose and that's it is the the classic one is everybody poos and it's I mean it's a much gentler take and it's not like going for the humour but it's just this kind of mm. 
sort of, sort of like a cross between this and the book of sleep that we did a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, <laughs> it's just like <laughs> here are a series of animals and and they all poo because everyone poos and here's yeah, the particular okay. way in which they poo. Um, so this is kind of like, I suppose, putting a bit more of a narrative on on that. Mm. Um, well, it's definitely that's definitely part of the reason for the genre of poo books for children is sort of demystifying it around like toilet learning age when children suddenly have a lot more interaction with their poo than they used to aye and who because um. who doesn't like a poo joke apart from me because <laughs> the entire plot revolves around poo um and the poo does stay on the mole's head for the entire book um until the flies eat it off I quite like his facial expressions through the book because I'm just looking at the picture now where he's sat with his arms crossed, sat on his bum, with the two flies nibbling the poo off his head. And he looks like, at first, kind of satisfied, but then there's just this little wobble in his mouth where he looks like he's at the hairdresser. You know when you're, like, at that point where you're having your hair cut, where you can see in the mirror what they're doing, and you're going, oh, my God, you better not be about to kind of get the back of the head mirror out and ask if that's all right, because this is definitely not done. Do you like... (laughs) It's that sort of like, yeah. I'm sure this will be fine, but right now I'm not sure about this. Yeah. Um, yeah. I... But also I think what made me really laugh as a kid is the the mole is not capable of producing enough poo for it to bother the dog. No, it's a purely symbolic gesture. Yeah. It's a tiny little peanut on the head of a massive dog. Is he even going to notice? It's going to like sit there while he's asleep. Yeah. Then he'll wake up, shake his head, it'll fly off, he'll never know. <laughs> I like I like his facial expressions. And the facial expressions, I mean, some of the animals are really, really enjoying doing a poo. Because basically each of them gets confronted and then they're like, no, my poo looks like this. And then like squeeze one out right in front of him. <clears throat> <laughs> and like the hair, for instance, like its eyes are rolling back in its head. As it does its poo, it's like it's it like it's this proper cheeky mischievous little grin. Like, oh god, yeah, yeah that's better. Um, I think the goat similarly just looks glazed. Uh, like all of them have this kind of like sort of glazed, like very self satisfied face on while they're pooing, which is quite funny. Um, and the mole just look and increase like stomping around. And then when yeah. he's stomping up to the dog kennel and he's got this little smirk on, it's like, it's a bit sort of like Beano, like... It is a bit, yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's that kind of, yeah. Well, and even though he's not depicted to be wearing clothes, he almost looks like he's wearing a little suit. Yeah, well, because he's got little winkle little picker shoes. shoes on and like yeah. tr- like trouser cuffs, but that are yeah. just his skin. I mean, I kind of... The poo sort of feels like it suits him. Yeah. After a while. Or it's them. quite stylized, isn't it? Him for the English version. Yeah. You know, and it's curled right on top of his head. None of it's fallen off. I do quite, and I do quite like that his main priority in tracking down who on earth did this and getting revenge, imme- like, entirely supersedes. Like, because the first thing I would do... If, is wipe the if poo off, right? someone or something right? pooed on me head, was would be uh, <laughs> get the poo off me head. But yeah. <laughs> he's so enraged and, and ready to... Uh, well, and he revenge. needs it for evidence. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did you do this? <laughs> yeah. He wants it to, to have it to point at when he goes and accuses people. <laughs> and that's what enables him to eliminate animals from his inquiries is the comparison so he needs to take it with him ah you wanted to talk about animals that were wearing glasses and yeah so were... when so when you you start the book you're like ah oh, the mole's wearing glasses that makes sense because a mole is, yeah but yeah. then but then who else has glasses like the horse, the horse and the pig yeah it's interesting that they made the choice to give them glasses but not clothes i guess because they need their trousers off to show off the pooing that's true yeah it would, they couldn't be wearing underwear. No, it would be, it would be more upsetting that, wouldn't it? If you just had yeah. like a cow with like <laughs> trousers with a little like Bavarian style bum flap or something. 
Yeah, or if she had to shimmy out of them first. Yeah. <laughs> Knock this off with these pants, I'll do a poo for you and prove that it's... For the poo joke aged child in your life, I think this is great. Yeah, probably up to about the age of eight, or yeah. 28, depending how I, I still really enjoy yeah. it. <laughs> But I think there's like a big dollop of nostalgia in there. Hey, um, I like that you saw a dollop. Um, I thought you would. Or kids who are potty training. Yeah. Agreed. <laughs> Matt didn't like that one very much. Okay. No, I think it's uh, honestly it's lovely. I, it's it's um, all right. You don't have to be into scatological humour. <laughs> No, it's good. It's of, of the two that we've read this week, it's not my favourite. Okay. I preferred The Wind in the Willows. Cool. Um, so should we start about The Wind in the Willows? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, it's okay. lovely, isn't it? Yeah. Isn't it lovely? It's beautiful nature writing, it really is. Just gorgeous. It's like, it's poetry. It's that close-up view, and it's sort of quite happy for nothing to happen for large stretches mm. of it. Just the yeah. description of their walks and the kind of coziness of coming back home. Do you want to read some out to us? One bit I've got here is um, when uh, they're going on a walk at, at winter and they go through a, a human settlement, they go through a village. The rapid nightfall of mid-December had quite beset the little village as they approached it on soft feet over a first thin fall of powdery snow. Little was visible but squares of a dusky orange-red on either side of the street where the firelight or lamplight of each cottage overflowed through the casements into the dark world without. Most of the low latticed windows were innocent of blinds, and to the lookers-in from outside, the inmates gathered round the tea-table absorbed in handiwork or talking with laughter and gesture, had each that happy grace which is the last thing the skilled actor shall capture the natural grace which goes with perfect unconsciousness of observation. Moving at will from one theatre to another, the two spectators, so far from home themselves, had something of wistfulness in their eyes as they watched a cat being stroked, a sleepy child picked up and huddled off to bed, or a tired man stretch and knock out his pipe on the end of a smouldering log. Yeah. It's lovely, and it? Just that idea of like, all really the little nice. windows being like theatre boxes and... Yeah. It's just, it's just gorgeous, and it's so. It's a lot of that kind of writing, and relatively little action. Yeah, and when there is action, mostly it's very low stakes. So in that way, it's very soothing. Um, do you know that Kenneth Graham made up these stories for his son's bedtime story yeah. to start with? Yeah, it's a similar. You can tell. Um, yeah, inauguration. Yeah. Um, so I think we should say it's a collection of little stories. For the most which part, yeah. have a thread going through them about Toad getting in trouble, going to prison, getting out, and going back to his house. But a lot you could read any of them out of sequence, and it would be fine. Uh, these just, like, mini-adventures, mostly with Mole and Rat. It's a series of individual stories, except it kind of isn't. Ratty and Mole... And Badger and Toad are the main characters. Yeah. I feel like Badger's only really ever a side character in Toad's story. Um, Ratty has his own chapters and narrative, some of which are gorgeous. I want to talk later about the the Traveller from Afar. Yeah. Um, beautiful. And then mm. Mole is kind of... In Mole, in a lot of ways, is the protagonist, because it kind of starts with yeah. him and he's spring cleaning, um, and he just gets, like, the call of summer. And makes his way down to the riverbank and then just gets caught up with Ratty going out boat and doing these adventures. And then, so you've got those and these little mini stories. And then you've got Toad. And Toad's narrative threads through the whole book. Yeah, and he's it, got the through line. In terms of plot, like it is Toad's story, right? But it feels mm. like an entirely different story <laughs> and like a different tone and a different texture. Yeah. It's much less cosy, the Toad stuff. Like, for me, it's my least favourite thread, is Toad's misadventures. I just felt... I mean, I know this is the point, but I felt really annoyed at Toad. I don't understand why Toad has any friends. Like, honestly, he's an awful friend. Why are the others still hanging out with him and helping him? I don't know. Well, because he's part <laughs> of well-to-do society. 
Right, so they're maintaining the status quo. Yeah. But he's not a pleasant friend. He's not fun. He probably is, is quite he? good fun. Oh, he's fun in the film. I don't think he's fun in the book. You'd probably have a good night out with him. You might. <laughs> <laughs> I would not. <laughs> oh. <laughs> he's <laughs> Boris Johnson to me. He's yeah, like this, like, okay. lovable buffoon. Yeah. Actually, total Tory, total owning class. But the whole you book's know. that. I mean, the, you know, Ratty's very kind of like... I mean, they've all got staff, right? Like What? No, they haven't. Oh, they do. Yeah, they do. Like, there's a bit... So when who, they're in Badger's... Who's got? When they're in... Well, it's never referred to directly, but when they're in Badger's place... Um, and, uh, like, you've got the little hedgehogs there who are helping out. And Badger mm-hmm. says, oh, um, it's time you were home now. I'll have someone make sure that you're uh, taken care of on your journey home. Like, that's none of them that's there. That's oh. just someone else. Like, when they're at Ratties towards the end, like, it's just Mole and Rat, and they're sat by the fireside, and Mole says, like, oh, I hear the clink of plates. Is supper ready? Like someone else is sorting out supper for them. Like they've all, oh, they've all I hadn't like spotted that. They're all like living in a state. Except Mole, Mole has got stuff. Mole. But that's the thing. Like it's yeah. it's so class written ridden because the whole mm. point of it is that Mole is like Mole's like lower middle class, right? And is kind of like the attitude of the others to Mole throughout the whole thing, and Mole's attitude to himself is he's like this wide eyed tourist newcomer to this world of splendour yeah. and glory. He's along for the ride yeah. and he's impressed by everything. But it's Edwardian, right? Like, it's 1908. Because I know yes. you've got issues as well with, like, the creatures of the wild wood being... There's a class thing there. And again, it's it's never explicit, but there's this sense that the weasels... It's, they and can't stories, help so. that they are any better than this. They're just what they are. Yeah. And, you know, don't associate with them. Yeah, but yeah. then when they do, when they come and, like, claim toad's house at the end it's like oh they're terrorists you know and we must reclaim the house from them and I mean, by force and I put mean, them back in their place i mean they sort of are right but it's kind of like that bit for me kind of felt like reading... i feel like squatters rights toad was supposed to be in prison for 20 years why shouldn't someone else move in it sort of feels like reading an account of like the build-up to the french revolution in a world where it didn't work, tooled from the point of view of the aristocracy. Yeah, like, yeah, you know, it the, really bothered me, the, the ending. These ruffians coming in and... Because yeah. to, be, like, to be fair, they are, like, it, and it is a bit of a riot, and it is, you know, it's that thing that's tricky to deal with, like, uprisings and stuff, and stuff getting broken, looting and smashed, but on the one hand, you think, like, in the context of things, that's kind of fair enough. But yeah. also, like, that's kind of uh, not, not the way to carry on, do you know what I mean? But oh no, like, I feel like they're entirely entitled to smash stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right. But I'm on the side of the proletariat here. Like, uh, I do uh, not think that Toad deserves that big haul. And then he throws himself a bloody party and makes one of the young weasels deliver his invitations. And he's like, oh, thank you, sir. Sorry, sir. Like, doffing his cap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really the reinstating of the status quo at the end. I hated the last two chapters and I love the book. I felt so safe with the nature stuff that I forgot that, like, this is a story about men who own big houses and have staff. Yeah. So then when that came back in at the end, for me, I felt really betrayed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But it totally goes together. You know, I think it often goes together, those things. You know, people who are very nostalgic about England the way it used to be you got to be a bit suspicious, right? <laughs> you know, it's like all well, very lovely is, about... Is it, to some extent, the sort of more innocent side of conservatism? Yeah, it's that I think that's softer, exactly what it is. Softer conserv- you know, I read an interesting thing. I think it was Monbiot, the mm. journalist, who wrote a thing that was like, the Conservative Party now are not conservatives. That the idea of conservatism was conserving british values and conserving yeah. the way things are and that a, a lot of that in itself is problematic but that what the conservatives at the minute do is like 
oh, what have we got that's worth anything? Sell it. Yeah. Which is sort of fundamentally <laughs> not that either. Do you know what I mean? But no, that kind no, of, I know, yeah. That sort of country gent, like, oh, preserving the good old days, is it, like it's a really problematic use of nostalgia that is dangerous. But is I think a lot... <sighs> a lot softer and a lot less dangerous than kind of yeah. what Tory has come to mean. Before going into this, I hadn't... So I've read the book for this episode. What I was familiar with was the 1996 live-action mm-hmm. film directed by Terry Jones, which is essentially Monty Python. You know, so John Cleese is in it. It's got Eric Idle as Raddy. Uh, so when you suggested Wind of the Willows, I was like, oh, yeah, and you should, you should watch the film. It's great. Because for me, it was oh. like, it, it was a childhood <laughs> film, right? Mm. You, you're not such a fan of the film, are you, Nina? Oh. I can see how if you watched it when you were little, you would form an attachment to it and you'd find it fun. But Matt, it's a terrible film. The book, to me, had this very calm, soothing, slightly disjointed feel to it. Yeah. The the film has built up the weasels as, like, proper baddies well, from the beginning. They're, 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 they're Nazis, essentially. That's... They're Nazis. Yeah. And there are no, you know, like, there are no Nazi connotations in the 1908 book. I think in the book, the weasels are just the lower classes. Yeah. They haven't got, you know, a horrible ideology behind them. They're just the poor. And I didn't really like... Like, they set them up to have, you know, like, drilled through Mole's home at the beginning. I mean, I can see they were trying to add an element of jeopardy to it and, like, urgency. But I kind of liked about the book that it didn't have that, that it was just sort of safe so uh, and pleasant yeah i, I mean it's interesting because having read the book like as i was reading through those bits of it where i was going oh my god i can so understand why nina hates the film having read the book first um because this is so beautiful and so lyrical and because I, I had been thinking oh well, i'll read the book and then i'll rewatch the film and getting to the end of the book i was like oh, i really don't want to watch that film right now like <laughs> i don't want to not watch it again but i'm like yeah totally, totally see what you mean what i think is interesting is like because what they've completely bypassed is the soft summer summery lyrical stuff yeah and they've zoned in on toad story right but for me like that kind of makes sense because the book is such a book of two halves right because you've got these beautiful pastoral chapters interspersed with this kind of like Worcester and Jeeves high action yeah farce silly kind of slapsticky carry on, right yeah. like even in the book like that change of tone yeah. is really notable it makes sense to me that that's what you'd pick up on so then I was thinking, right, because I've, d- I've done a bit of further research into this, because I was looking like, what other adaptation there have been? And there's been loads of adaptations. Well, so there was a Disney one. So there was a yeah. 1949 sort of animated adaptation. But in that film, again, like, even more so, that's where they start threading through the weasels as the antagonist. It's even more kind yeah. of hijinks and all the rest of it. Um and the first ever ad- adaptation of it was A.A. Um, a. A. Milne wrote a play of it. Yeah, and I saw that. Um, but the play was called The Adventures of Mr. Toad. Yeah. So clearly, like, because what I'd been thinking going back to the 1949 one is uh, in, a, in a previous time where maybe audiences were less dependent on super fast action maybe there would be more of the pastoral stuff. But it's like, nah, straight away, like what mm-hmm. people have zoned in on while adapting this is Toad Story. That's always been what's been commercial about it, isn't it? If you are going to watch the Terry Jones film, which I'm sure Nina wouldn't recommend, I still would. Um, I, I would actually, I would say, if you, if, you want to, if you want to experience both, I'd watch the film first. Watching the film won't spoil or ruin the experience of reading the book afterwards. But if you read the book first, you'll be horribly disappointed by the film. And it's a really funny <laughs> film. It's, you know, it's none of the oh, soft lyrical it's stuff. It's not that funny. It's uh, not it's that mon- funny, Matt. It's Monty Python. I mean, oh, I just thought it was wonderfully silly. It's, I mean, it's very Monty Python. It is a lot of the Monty Python crew. So it's that yeah. kind of humour. Um, I like other Monty Python films. This is not up there with, like, The Holy Grail or Life of Brian. It's not. Maybe not. It's not as funny. 
watch watch the 1949 version you won't enjoy yeah. it but it's only half an hour and it'll make a lot more sense of why the 1996 sure. version exists the way it does i know you wanted to talk about the piper at dawn chapter oh that was my favorite chapter it's a ratty and moly spin-off by themselves um and their friend the otter has lost track of his youngest child and the otter's really worried and he's like swimming up and down in the night looking for him and waiting for him at the place that he normally shows up and rat and mole decide they're going to help so they go out on their boat looking for him and they come to this mysterious place this mysterious island that they'd never known about before and they find the baby otter basically in the arms of a river god or something or a nature god He's described yeah. as having horns, I think, and hooves. And there in that utter clearness of the imminent dawn, while nature, flushed with fullness of incredible colour, seemed to hold her breath for the event, he looked in the very eyes of the friend and helper, saw the backward sweep of the curved horns gleaming in the growing daylight, saw the stern, hooked nose between the kindly eyes that were looking down on them humorously, while the bearded mouth broke into a half-smile at the corners, saw the rippling muscles on the arm that lay across the broad chest, the long, supple hands still holding the panpipes only just fallen away from the parted lips, saw the splendid curves of the shaggy limbs disposed in majestic ease on the sward, saw, last of all, nestling between his very hooves, sleeping soundly in entire peace and contentment, the little round podgy childish form of the baby otter. All this he saw for one moment breathless and intense, vivid on the morning sky, and still as he looked he lived, and still as he lived he wondered. And it's the most beautiful chapter, oh. so they, fu they see him, and they're so overcome with awe in like, you know, the old fashioned spiritual way, or as in like, like a divine intervention, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and they just fall on their knees and cry. It feels very spiritual. Like, it really feels like the piper is a god. Mm. And they just sort of fall to their knees in adoration. Mm. And the piper sets down the little otter and disappears. And then it says the otter stirs and wakes up and cries as the child who fell asleep in the arms of his nanny and woke up without her. Yeah. And they, you know, they take the little otter back to his dad and the dad's really pleased and everything's okay. And then they can't remember it because the last gift of the piper is to erase himself from the memories of the little animals he's saved lest they go the rest of their life longing for that moment again. Mm. Yeah. I, I thought it was really, really lovely. And Rat can still sort of hear it. Forget me. Forget. Well, can you find it? Have you found the bit? Um... I think I highlighted it. Well, the bit you've highlighted... Oh, yeah, so he hears some words being sung in the reeds that he kind of half catches. He says, Let me try and give you them, said the rat softly, his eyes still closed. Now it is turning into words again, faint but clear. Lest the oar should dwell and turn your frolic to fret, you shall look on my power at the helping hour, but then you shall forget. Now the reeds take it up. Forget, forget, they sigh, and it dies away in a rustle and a whisper. Then the voice returns. Lest limbs be reddened and rent, I spring the trap that is set, and as I loose the snare you may glimpse me there, for surely you shall forget. Row nearer, mole, nearer to the reeds, it is hard to catch and grows each minute fainter. Help her and heal her, I cheer, small waifs in the woodland wet. Strays I find in it, wounds I bind in it, bidding them all forget. Yeah. And then, That's my favourite chapter. It's just gorgeous. I'm reading it out because I've, I've not read it out loud before. You know, that sense that sense of it, be it feeling like poetry, like mm. it's riddled with kind of half rhymes and rhythms yeah. as well. You know, you, uh, it feels a bit like a sort of... Yeah, a bit like a sort of spoken word piece read out loud. It's, uh... The other chapter I was grabbed by in a similar vein was Wayfarers All. So it's this winter's coming and all of the 
birds that fly south are starting to prepare for the fly south, but Rat's getting really despondent because he's like, oh, this happens every year and everyone leaves and not ready for this yet. Yeah. He's a bit mopey and sort of everything's changing and he's feeling it and mm. and he's trying to hang out with the field mice, but they're all ready, kind of clearing the homes out of the fields before the harvest reapers come. And, and he he's just sat by the river and this um this old rat wanders along this rat is from constantinople originally and then this this rat is sort of basically a traveler and is just recounts to rat yawa rat the stories of his journeys from kind of the middle east up round the adriatic and across the mediterranean sort of round spain and up through portugal and he's like He's, he's a coaster, he says. He's not he's not one for the high seas. It's the port life that's for him. So he's just stopping off at various ports. And and then his, uh, his, his most recent experiment has been trying to live in land and has lived at a farm just up the way, just north. So when he first meets Rat and he's sort of saying, oh, so you just live here by the river? And he's saying, yes. And he's like, yeah, it's the very best life. And Rat, he's saying, it's the only life. Yeah. And he says, well, no, that's not exactly what I said. It's the best life. I know it's the best <laughs> life. And now knowing that it's the best life, I'm off on my travels again. I'm called away. You know, and again, there's this yeah. slight mystical thing. The, the wayfarer, while he's chatting to him, is saying, and you will come too, of course. And then there's this kind of very subtle, almost dream sequence where Rat's saying, and, the, and then all he could see was a speck of white disappearing on the horizon. And mechanically went home to start packing. Yeah, was the was the wayfarer a ghost? I don't know. I I really don't know because then when he's recounting it to Mole later, like it's very much presented like it's real. But again, it just toes that line beautifully mm. of like it really doesn't matter. Like simply like the river gods, it doesn't matter whether it's real or yeah. not. No, what's important yeah. is the experience. Yeah. So so yeah. So Ratty's ready to leave, and Mole kind of catches him and says, "What's going on?" and notices that his eyes are changed and are streaked with grey and green of like storm seas or something um yeah. manages to sit him down says you haven't written any poetry in a while tactfully puts some pen and paper next to him and leaves the room and comes back later and ratty's sort of scribbling away and then on the one hand, it feels like a really well-worked depiction of seasonal affected depression, which definitely, like, impacts me. But then also, like, because I've never been, like, off around the world travelling, but I've got friends who've yeah. done that, and it's always been a temptation, and there's always been something keeping me at home. And there's that, a few moments I've had of, like, a moment where you could kind of just answer the call or drop everything and go yeah. and the sort of well this is what you said about like the mars mission that you were like yeah, yeah. right let's go. yeah you were just in that moment you yeah were ready. totally totally and the appeal of that but also like the mm. come down from that and the kind of um you know this wayfarer rat is saying you know go south you're young still go south you'll overtake me and then at some point when you're tired of all that, you can come back here with stories to tell and, and you'll pass me on the way. And you, it's not explicitly said, but you're kind of thinking like, oh, no, but you, you, you couldn't. It's a bit like that, um, like the movie makes at the end of the Lord of the Rings when it's like, you know, they come back to the Shire and it's like, we've done that journey, we're back now, but like, I literally mm. can't call this home anymore. Like, I, you know, I can't settle here. Yeah. So it's this real tear and it's so flitting, but it's this sort of this opportunity that he, it feels like he would take if the mole doesn't catch him to just drop everything and go. Mm. But it feels then that yeah. like that would be him gone forever. And again, that's where the sort of mysticism of it comes in. It's sort of like, I I think think so, like, yeah. it, like it feels weirdly close now I'm thinking about it to like, I suppose, suggestions of suicide like it's this kind of yeah a little bit you know it's this um the call of the void i suppose mm. i don't yeah well especially because rat isn't a character who's ever expressed any desire to go anywhere yeah he's very much a home you know, bird he, he's super attached to the river yeah. 
and his little house. He's not like someone who's always cherished ambitions of travelling the world. It's just that right now he's in a hard spot and it would be so nice to just leave that hard spot behind for anything. It's also kind of lovely to me that writing is presented as the cure. Yes, yes. And I feel like... And that Mole thinks of it, that Mole's like, you haven't done any poetry yeah. lately. Here's a pen and paper. I'll just give you some space. That's a lovely um, snapshot of their friendship, and that's something else that's really, really nice in this book, is the friendship between Rat and Mole, I think, is really affecting yeah. and really, really close and loving and caring in a way that... I think for the next few decades, male friendships weren't depicted like this. Mm. I felt properly betrayed by the last two chapters. I was like, I've been on this lovely journey of friendship and nature and just letting things be, existing in the world and believing and living. Oh, and now we've got to have a small war to chuck out the poor people. What? <laughs> well, I suppose what it is, is that because you've got kind of the the pastoral stuff and toad storyline literally leapfrogging each other it's just sort of chapter by chapter yeah um and mm -hmm. it's i guess it's the fact that it's the toad story that wins and resolves it all yeah i mean i can totally see why he felt like then he needed to go out with a bang yeah like with some action scenes i can see the temptation to do that and why you'd do that and also we don't know what kind of child his son was maybe his son was really down for the pastoral stuff or maybe he wasn't maybe his son was like more fighting yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> more guns we don't know yeah. um and the class you know the class thing as well you, you know as you yeah. say the weasels and the stoats are this uh, and the stoats are kind of like an underclass yeah yeah. I personally, if I ever read this to anyone, I'm skipping the last two chapters. I don't care. I'm not doing it. Um, <laughs> but I think it. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I'd let them make their own mind up. Well, okay. So if I was reading the last two chapters, I think this is really a good place to have a talk about class. Because some, like some cannier kids, will ask those questions without being prompted. Oh, of course. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. there would be kids who are like, why are they still friends with Toad? Yes, like, <laughs> cause sure. It, it is a question that bears answering. And, <laughs> and you know, one answer to that that possibly Kenneth Graham might have given would be like, oh, because loyalty wins out and everyone deserves a second chance. He um, gets a lot of chances. Yeah, but that's what I mean. Whereas, the, you know, <laughs> yeah. the, 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 the answer could also be along the lines of, because they're ingrained in a class system and they <laughs> yeah so i think this book would definitely invite that conversation if that's a conversation you want to have with the child you're reading to it is also not one to avoid if you don't want to have that conversation because it's totally possible to read as just a gorgeous yes miracle i mean as you know putting all that aside just as an introduction to like appreciating nature animals the countryside i think it's just gorgeous for that yeah know? Have and you got then, anything else to say? Oh, probably loads of things, but I think that'll that'll do. So that was episode seven of Even the Trunchbull. Thanks for listening. Once again, if you've any thoughts on books you loved as a kid. Or love now as a kid. Let us know. Or ask a grown up to let us know. We're at even the trunchbull at gmail dot com and on Twitter at trunchbullpod. Intro music for this episode and every episode is What a Wonderful Day by Shane Ivers. And remember, kids' books can be for everyone, because we've all been kids. Even, Even the Trunchbull. The trunchbull.